Welcome back to another episode of Both Sides Now. Today we're very lucky to be joined by a Green Party co-leader, the Honourable James Shaw. So thank you for your time, James, and welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me on the show. So we start every podcast with the episode, with a question about your political ideology and, ph and philosophy and which one you identify with. Uh, well, <laughs> the short answer to that is I identify as green. Um, and uh, I say that because... Um, uh, I think that there is a kind of economic philosophy to green politics that is distinct from um, the kind of more traditional, um, uh, you know, political philosophies that are espoused by Labour and National. Um, and I've always kind of identified in, in that way. Having said that, there's kind of layers of nuance, right? So uh, economically, I'm probably about reasonably close to Keynesian. Um, uh, ecologically, I'm, you know, that my view is that, uh, you know, if we if we don't live within the kind of boundaries of our environment, then no, nothing else is going to matter a great deal. It's changing lanes slightly um, to the Green Party. Obviously, been the headlines a lot recently over the recent months with the Green Party co-leadership battle. How do you sort of feel that's like place you with the Green, um, or how do you feel within the Green Party following the, I guess, kind of they didn't support yeah. you initially to be co-leader again? Well, I mean, this is going to be a bit counterintuitive, but really good. Um, I uh, actually had, I mean, I had tons of support, right? And, and I heard from something like 400 people in the week after the uh, AGM. Um, but then I also spent kind of most of the next six weeks, you know, traveling around the country and hanging out with our members and supporters and, and kind of talking things through. And after two years of being largely trapped in Wellington because of COVID restrictions, um, it was actually really nice to be able to kind of connect. And then of course, you know, the subsequent vote was, you know, overwhelming, right? So um, uh, I actually felt better about that process than you might think. Um, and it gave me an opportunity to kind of put some um, kind of markers in the ground. Um, and it was great to be able to see, you know, people saying, well, yes, actually, we want that. We do want those things, right? Um, so I, th I think that was good. The other thing is that actually, uh, it really motivated several hundred people to get more actively involved in the party as well. So that was, you know, really good and that, you know, all these people piled in. One of the things that I was saying at the time was that I, I wanted to make sure that that didn't then peter out once the co-leadership question had been settled, because we immediately have the local body elections in front of us and we need you know, hundreds of supporters and volunteers to help us out with that. And then, of course, we're gearing up for next year's general election as well. So I kind of saw it, saw it actually as an opportunity to do a bit of movement building ahead of uh, two elections. A lot of commentators kind of came out following that and sort of said, oh, it sort of shows the Green Party and more concerned with the social issues and the environmental issues. Yeah. Do you think that's a fair criticism? No. <laughs> No, I, I actually think uh, the, the way I would describe it is more to do with your theory of change, right? So there's a spectrum, and at one end of the spectrum, and I think this is the people who, who kind of voted against me originally, um, there's a view that the compromises of being in government just aren't worth it, right? And we're trading too much away, and actually we would be better not to be involved uh, with the government, at least under the current circumstances, and to be able to use our kind of, um, you know, sort of a position from being an opposition to be able to try and shift the public narrative, right? Now, that's a that's actually a valid idea, you know, as, as, as a critique. And the other end of the spectrum is there are people who think that we should, um, you know, take the opportunity and any opportunity that we have under the right circumstances to actually get into the kind of the belly of the beast that is government um, and make as much change as we can with the under the circumstances. I fall very firmly into that camp and I'm probably most identified with it. So I think it's more about that, whether it was someone who was more concerned about, you know, um, uh, you know the environment or climate or whether they were more concerned about, um, you know, social justice issues. Uh, it still comes down to that, that kind of way that you see the role of the Greens as a political party in creating change. So you talk about that you're subscribed to the idea of wanting to be in government. Would you look to work with a national government? Well, we, we always have, right? So if, when we were in opposition and under the John Key national government, um, certainly in the first term, uh, you know, we did 
quite a lot of work with the national government then around um, uh, energy efficiency and um, the home insulation program. Uh, I mean, not a lot of people realise this, but whilst we negotiated that with Labour and kind of set it up with the, um, the Helen Clark Labour government, we continued it on under the national government and actually got a, um, a, a dramatically larger increase in the funding. Um, so I think we've always tried to maintain a constructive relationship across the House. Um, uh, I think it's unlikely that we would look to enter any kind of coalition um, because, you know, the, you know, if you think that we're finding it tough to deal with the compromises that we have to deal with under a Labour government, the compromises that we would have to deal with under a national government, I think would probably uh, stretch us far too far, unless uh, national themselves underwent a fairly radical kind of policy overhaul. What are some of the compromises you feel like you're making working with Labour? Well, the, I mean, the, the kind of obvious, like tax reform, you know, like we've, we've always wanted a, a far more progressive uh, tax uh, regime and, um, you know, the kind of emphasis that we have under the current tax system around um, taxing people who work but not, you know, people who own um, and, and so on is inherently unfair, but it also shortchanges um, uh, the public service and it shortchanges um, people who uh, work for a living and have to pay income tax, um, but it also uh, produces other kind of weird things in um, our economy, like a massive over uh, investment in the housing uh, market and not in the productive parts of the economy. So we've always had that. It was hugely frustrating not to get that over the line and to have that ruled out for this entire government because um, it's not like we're anticipating that National will uh, <laughs> kind of come in on that. So, you know, there's that, there was that. Um, and then, uh, you know, there's, there's kind of, there, there's just kind of, Frustrations everywhere, right? Because you, you know we're a, a pretty radical party. We want to go um, pretty fast on on things. I think if you look at um, you know the increase in inequality and the increase in emissions uh, and the degradation of our biodiversity, these are things that we've been talking about for three decades, and we've been proved right on them. And now it's kind of like, but if we've been proved right on it, surely we should kind of crack on and do something about it, right? Um, but I, we've just got a very incrementalist body politic. Do you think the Greens would ever grow to being a 40, 50% party? Well, I, I don't think it's healthy for anybody to be a 50% party. Um, uh, I do think that there's a lot more potential for, um, talking about different forms of growth, uh, for, <laughs> for the Greens to be a larger party. And if you look at more um, uh, uh, um, mature proportional representation parliaments, in Northern Europe, say, where they've been doing proportional representation since World War II, um, then, uh, you know, you do see um, more fluidity um, and more balance between the parties. I think we've still got a very kind of first-past-the-post political culture, even though we're, you know, two and a half decades down, down the route with MMP. In my first economics lecture, I was told economics is a study of how we allocate scarce resources more efficiently. Pretty much everything we talk about, it's economic growth and business and government. Now we've grown to the point where we've massively exceeded the Earth's carrying capacity. Do we need degrowth now? Is that the only answer? Yeah, but but I think you I think that you can be unsophisticated about that or sophisticated about that, right? So um, often when we talk about um, growth, we talk about gross domestic product. Mm -hmm. And gross domestic product is just economic throughput, right? It's just a flow of activity. You know, and every time you add a human to the population, you get economic growth because the activity of that person feeding themselves and you know, housing themselves and clothing themselves adds to GDP. Um, we need a ton more wind turbines and solar panels and so on and so forth, those things will add to GDP. So there are some things that I think that we need to grow. I also think that there are some things that we need to shrink. Um, and so, you know, we need to shrink uh, and, and in fact eliminate the use of fossil fuels. Um, and, and so the kind of net effect of, of that on GDP is, is almost inconsequential um, because the question is, um, are you are you growing the things that are good and are going to serve us well, and are you eliminating the things that are not? And GDP counts both, and it doesn't distinguish between between them. So um, we know that not you know if if everybody on Earth lived like we do, uh, 
we'd be well past this you know, point of collapse, right? So, mm-hmm. so we are going to need an economics um, that allocates increasingly scarce resources to an increasingly large population. So by definition, there's uh, at the very least a lot of efficiency that's involved in that. Do you sort of have a, if you had a magic wand, how would you go about fixing that? Do you have an ideal world you could solve the problem? Uh, well, I don't tend to spend a lot of my time thinking about in an ideal world <laughs> if I had a magic wand because that would just lead to frustration. <laughs> um, but, you know, if, if you look at what I'm doing in the climate change space, um, uh, the, the kind of the mission there is to decouple our um, carbon dioxide emissions or our greenhouse gas emissions from economic activity, whether that, ac- whether that activity is going up or down. Uh, you know, it is possible that you can increase economic activity and decrease your emissions simultaneously. And there are only about 20 countries in the world that have actually pulled that off yet, but we all need to do that. Now, if you do that and you see economic growth you know, continuing upwards and emissions continuing downwards, is that degrowth? You know, that probably wouldn't count as degrowth, but it's degrowth in emissions, and that's a very good thing. Um, and, and the way that I sort of see it is this is, a, this is a multi-generational challenge, and so I sort of see my job as to, uh, to kind of break those two things apart. Now, over time and in the future, there will be other things that decouple as well, Um, And so that could ultimately end up as a kind of a degrowth scenario, right? But but it's it's not as sort of simplistic as saying, well, we just need to shrink everything, you know, which isn't wildly popular. One of the key values um, or or, or key defining features of a neoliberalist um, perspective is, is limited government, but that the fundraising for that limited government should come from taxing externalities. Mm. That's something we don't really do. Most of our um, government income yeah. comes from GST income tax. Mm. Philosophically, should we be increasingly looking to revenue raise from the bad stuff in society yeah. like sugar, yeah. plastic tax, carbon tax, nitrate yeah, tax? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. The, the only thing is, so that's a Pagovian tax, <laughs> uh, you know, which when, when you're which we absolutely should do, and we do it in some domains, right? So we have pretty steep excise taxes on alcohol and, and tobacco, for example. Um, the emissions trading scheme essentially places a cost on, it's not a tax, but it places a cost on um, you know, climate-causing uh, pollution uh, and so on. And people keep asking me, what do I think the ideal carbon price is? Well, I think the ideal carbon price is actually zero because you wouldn't need it because there wouldn't be any pollution. And so whilst I think that we should be um, using environmental taxes you know, much more than we do, and other countries use them much more than we do, uh, you also have to sort of assume that revenue from those things is going to decline at some point because people will eliminate the use of those things. And therefore, government revenue is going to need to come from somewhere else. So you're always going to need, a, I think, a diversified sort of portfolio of revenue streams for government. A common metric for um, climate change policies is the dollar value per tonne in emissions sequestered or avoided from that policy. Mm-hmm. That's not really one of the key um, statistics that leads in the emissions reduction fund. For example, the clean car rebate policy, it's yeah. like $350 a tonne for emissions reduction. Yeah. Why should taxpayers be paying for that as a policy when there's you know, potentially you know, $50 native, um, n- native forest carbon credits where you could get seven times the climate impact per dollar spent? Well, a couple of reasons. Um, one of which is that, um, so the, the clean car discount, you have to remember, is at least in theory revenue neutral because um, the rebates that go to people who buy EVs and low, low emission vehicles is paid for by um, people who are buying the most inefficient polluting vehicles. Mm. So it's not. But you a, could spend that money on another project. Yeah, we could. But if you wanted to get the same result uh, in terms of decarbonizing our transport fleet, from the emissions trading scheme, you'd have to have an emissions price of about $500 a tonne, right? So um, I don't think anywhere in the world uses their carbon tax or their ETS as the only uh, tool that they have in the toolbox. The other thing is that there's a difference between gross emissions and net emissions, right? So gross emissions being what we put into the atmosphere, net emissions is what we pull into the atmosphere minus what we take out of the atmosphere. And um, we have uh, not yet managed to start getting the total amount of emissions down, i.e. our gross emissions, and that is actually the most important thing, is that those 
gross emissions start to come down. Because if you just want to plant your way out, you, you'll run out of land, right? If you stop, if you continue putting pollution into the atmosphere at the rate that we do, and then using trees to then try and pull at least some portion of that that out, then then you just have to plant everything in, mm. in trees. On this uh, dollar value per ton metric, with the um, farm levy approach for the Hiwaka Ekanoa, is um, yeah. it seems like the sector is in, at the moment, from my perspective, majority and behind the farm levy approach. Yeah. That um, will uh, potentially achieve a thirteen million dollar carbon dioxide equivalent uh, re reduction in emissions for almost 0.7 billion um, in spending, and that's not counting all the money that the farmers will have to pay for the levy, which is a pretty, uh, which is a huge amount of money to spend for a relatively limited emissions reduction that we might, um, we might have that emissions reduction anyway, just be, yeah. from market forces in the dairy sector. Is that an efficient policy, do you think? Uh, run the numbers by me again. So 13 million tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent reduction from 2025 to 2030. Yeah. And 0.7 billion in spending. So this is like the number one. That's how you compare the dollar value yeah. per, per ton. Hiwaka Ekanoa hasn't even come up with that. And where does the 0.7 billion come from? Uh, that's what Hiwaka Ekanoa said. It's, it's it's roughly 300 and it's 640 million odd, odd. Yeah. 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 Well, and sorry, is that the total levies that? That, that's the total uh, bureaucracy spending for oh, the yes. Ekenai, yeah, and yeah. on top of that is the levy spending. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the thing about if you want to run a farm level system, um, that is quite complex and it requires, you know, um, IT, it requires mm -hmm. legislation, it requires regulations, it requires enforcement. Um, and uh, so it, it is a, you know, it's a, heavy, it's a heavy system to run to have every single farm in the country have a dashboard that they're able to, you know, calculate their, their mm. on farm emissions, um, and that's that. That is the proposal that the that the sector came up with, right? So um, I uh, think that it's um, possible to do it for less than that. Mm. Um, uh, but you know, like I said, it's it's the sector's proposal. Um, the other thing is that the. Um, the projected emissions reductions in that uh, were kind of, as you say, you know, pretty weak, uh, mm -hmm. given the kind of scale of what we're up against, but also the scale of the project. So, since we received their recommendations, we've been working on um, uh, some modifications um, that would uh, improve the performance of the program. So, we'll have some more to say about that in the not too distant future. Yeah, well, I'm lo looking for looking forward yeah. to he hearing that. Um, and so. With, I guess with climate change policies, realizing that for the, each dollar we spend, we want to maximize emissions reduction or yeah. removals. We want some co-benefits, but um, we mostly want to do it for climate change. I've chatted to a bunch of MPs about geoengineering. None of them know what it is. Yeah. Can you explain geoengineering? Uh, well, when you say no one knows what it is, it sort of depends what version you're talking about, right? Because you could say that cutting down all of the country's forests in the first place was geoengineering, no, right? Yeah. Um, uh, but um, when when we talk about geoengineering, usually people are referring to um, things like uh, putting iron filings into the ocean uh, to increase the uptake of um, of carbon dioxide in the oceans, or uh, to use aerosols in the atmosphere, um, you know, deployed by aeroplanes to kind of increase the reflective um, uh, surface of the planet and bounce more of that heat into the atmosphere. Um, but the, but you know geoengineering could be could you know it's a term that covers a multitude of sins. I so it the, depends what you're asking about. Obviously, the Green yeah. Party's current policy stance is anti-GMO, anti-G sort of um, policies. Where do you stand on that? And do you think it's time for a change on that policy? Well, the you know I think there is a conversation that's going on both within the Greens and in society as a whole where. The kind of um, genetic engineering technologies that we were talking about in the 1990s, uh, no one is really considering uh, those anymore. Um, and um, then the, the debate has gotten very caught up in, a, in a, you know, a number of different sort of ways, right? So part of it is about the application. So the main debate back in the 90s and the early 2000s was around in the food in the food system, but we use genetic technologies in medicines, um, you know, we can use them for uh, conservation purposes and so on. So if you ask people uh, who are queasy about it and you say, well, if there was a way to um, 
uh, for example, get rid of our wilding pine uh, problem in this country, um, people would have less of a problem with that than they would about the use of um, G in food systems. So there's, first of all, there's a question about the application. Second of all, um, there's a question around safety. That's a scientific question. Third is a question around um, market acceptance, right? And I can tell you about a bottled water company in California that sells GE-free water, right? <laughs> now that's kind of bonkers, right? Because of course water is, you know, two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen. It doesn't have a genetic component, but the level of concern amongst, you know, a, a certainly a portion of consumers would say that actually people perceive GE-free as pure. So then the question is, look, if the industry wants to go down, um, you know, introducing uh, genetic technologies, uh, what risk does that then have to brand New Zealand or to, or to those industries? Um, and, and so that's another question. And the fourth component is around intellectual property control. And I, I don't think Monsanto did kind of anybody any favours uh, because the way that they, you know, controlled the IP and got, you know, very low-income farmers in developing countries like India and so on, kind of hooked on their product, um, uh, I think was rapacious. Um, and uh, so, in in any debate, you want to kind of be able to pick apart those those different elements. Do you think GE is going to be one of our solutions for climate change? I don't know. I don't know. I think maybe not polluting the atmosphere would be a good solution to climate change. <laughs> um, but, but um, uh, you know, like I said, I think if you're going to, if the country's going to shift its stance, it needs to work through all four of those, all four of those components. Um, and, and I know that there are kind of conversations that are occurring about that. You know, the um, Prime Minister's Chief Science Advisor has done some quite good work on that. The previous Prime Minister's Chief Science Advisor also did some, did some quite good work on that. But it is something that you want to step through very carefully because the last thing that you want to do um, is to... Uh, say, well, you know, we're going to use, um, you know, GE technology so that we can keep on doing what we do today um, in, you know, the agricultural space, for example, and then find that in doing so, you've completely devalued your exports, right, and collapse your industry because kind of high-end consumers in North America and Europe that we sell to uh, don't want it. So, you know, it's... I think there are other things that you could do first that would make more of a difference without placing yourself at that kind of risk. Most of the public now is against the idea of having pines in the permanent forest category, and I think a lot of scientists are against that. The two positives of leaving them in there are uh, a lower price in the ETS, so there's less um, pressure passed on to everyday consumers, cost, cost of living, and also um, some people stand to make a hell of a lot of money out of um, pines staying in the ETS, particularly some... Um, you know, I, I, I guess uh, there's, there's a notion out there that iwi business groups, yeah. perhaps, uh, you know, with a key lobbyer for y yourself and Stuart Nash to keep it in. Is this a case of putting um, profit before climate and biodiversity? Well, the, you've got to remember that one of the other benefits of having fast growing exotics in the emissions trading scheme is that you sequester more carbon sooner, right? And the fact that those fast growing exotics uh, do sequester carbon at a much faster rate is why the economics of um, planting is so different between exotics and natives. And when we did the consultation on that earlier this year, essentially the finding that came back from all of that was that um, the economics of, at least at the moment, the economics of um, planting native forests is so rubbish that you're just not going to get any substantial forests at all if you also exclude natives from the permanent forest category. So, um, and, and at the same time, pretty much everybody that we've spoken to uh, would like us to be, um, and this includes people who are advocating strongly for the use of exotics uh, in the near term, would like us to be able to work out how to do uh, native afforestation. So that's, that's kind of the challenge that's in front of us. Mm. Um, I'm from a dairy farm up north and I think there's quite a notion in the dairy farming community especially that the Greens are anti-farmers, um, kind of want to move away, move to more plant-based um, eating type of products. What do you say to that sort of, to farmers who give that criticism of you? Well, um, I would, no, I would say that we're not anti-farming at all, um, but we're anti-pollution um, and, uh, you know, the fact that we've kind of poisoned our soil and our water um, and our atmosphere 
through any economic activity, whether that economic activity is farming or steel making um, or energy production, is you know um, just something that we have to deal with, right? I, I just think that's a function of human civilization. Um, uh, moving towards uh, more plant-based foods is not anti-farming; it's just a different type of farming. Uh, and I'd have to say it's kind of reflected in consumer choice. So, former stats minister, <laughs> factoid for you, in 2013, in the 2013 census, 7% of New Zealanders reported that they were vegetarians. In the 2018 census, five years later, it was 14%. It had doubled in five years. Um, and now we've got another census next year. It'll be pretty interesting to see where, um, uh, where, where that happens. So consumer preferences are changing as well, recognising, of course, that the vast majority of our uh, milk and meat is actually exported rather than consumed domestically, but you know, you, you know, so that, you, that's also a factor, right? So, do you think the Greens are with the policies they're putting towards uh, the environment are looking to kind of take farmers along with them, or do you think it's going to, the farmers are going to struggle economically under Green Party policy? No, look, we've everything that we've so everything that we've done, we've tried to say um, here is how you can um, reduce your emissions and make more money on farm. Right, and actually, we know, and back when the milk price was like four dollars a kilo, um, a lot of farmers actually discovered this out of necessity, which is that they, if they reduce their, in the most intensive dairy farms, right, it doesn't work everywhere, it doesn't work in every farm system, but in some of the most intensive dairy systems, if they reduce their herd size by about fifteen percent, um, call it ten to twenty, because it did vary on each farm, then they could reduce their input costs, right, because you weren't having to buy in you know, PK or other food supplements, you weren't having to put so much water or um, irrigation, you weren't having to put so much fertiliser down uh, in order to, you know, kind of feed the beast, so to speak. And actually what that meant was, is that at a, at a low price, they were kind of able to break even. Now, as the price recovered, a number of them then didn't re-intensify because of course, all of that is margin, right? So they're making more money now than they were then, but, their emissions have come down dramatically as well, sort of anywhere, again, between about 10 and 15 percent, depending on uh, depending on the farm system. So there are ways of changing the business model without GE, without any new technology, you know, without magic seaweed, nothing like that, just business model innovation, which actually means that the farm makes more money. The problem is there's less volume coming off the farm and going up to, you know, Fonterra, et cetera. And so they're making less money at the processor level. And of course, because the processes are owned by the farmers, that then gets reflected both in the dividend and in the, uh, mm -hmm. in the price. But the farm itself is more profitable. So there is a system problem there, which says that actually, you know, um, some farmers are trapped in a intensive model where they've had to take on considerable bank debt in order to put in place the infrastructure necessary, high input costs in order to kind of feed feed that kind of machine. And actually their farm is no more profitable. In fact, it may be less profitable because it's because it's an intensive model. So we're sort of saying, well, how do we make an intervention where actually the on-farm economics are better uh, than they um, otherwise would be? So you're actually, so the farmer's actually making more money, um, but in a way that reduces pollution. With having that less output, do you then have concerns for what that's going to be the ramification for the wider New Zealand economy? Because obviously dairy is a massive export, we rely on that largely to help support our economy. We do you think there's other room in the economy to sort of pick up potentially if yeah, we absolutely. lose it? Yeah, but I mean, you look at our, I mean, we're a services-based economy, right? So, um, but most of that is non-tradable, so it occurs within, uh, within the New Zealand economy. But if you look at the growth in um, tourism, up until recent events, <laughs> uh, if you look at the growth in uh, international education, um, if you look at um, you know the movie industry and the video game industry, uh, you know, and and now you know other um, uh, you know computer-based services off the back of that um, as well. That um, you know our economy is considerably larger now, and it's more diversified than it's ever been before, um, and you know even within the agricultural sector, you know, I mean. Um, dairy farming is what five six thousand dollars per hectare revenue, gross revenue. Uh, in um, apples, it's like seventy thousand um, dollars, and uh, kiwi fruits something like one hundred and twenty thousand at the moment. I mean, it's orders of magnitude different. So I think if I think what's happened in the last sort of 30, 40 years or so is that is that we've kind of built these 
verticals that are really tight, you know, and you're kind of stuck in them. But if you're if, if farmers were able to kind of think about their block of land and what's the highest economic use of that of that land, you, you know, you could be a little bit more agnostic about you know what's the precise you know form of animal farming that I want to do or um, or horticulture or, or whatever, right? You'd, you'd kind of be thinking, well, what, what's the best use of that? But we've built these really quite rigid um, uh, vertical value chains and we've kind of tied people into them um, in ways that actually make it really in, uh, unflexible for them. Have you got a guilty conscience about all the flying you do? <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> and, and not just about that, um, yeah. but it's really difficult to participate in modern society uh, without burning fossil fuels. My whole job is about making it easier to participate in society without fossil fuels. Um, Chris Luxton uh, has said that we want everyone in society to get ahead. Um, does that imply that other people have got to get behind if other people are getting ahead? Uh, ahead? Well, I mean, you'd have to ask him about what he means by that. But uh, you know, what he's saying, what he, I guess, he's saying, no, we want everyone to get ahead, um, which implies in that worldview that no, there will be no one who's not ahead. Um, but, you know, our society is far less kind of equal and inclusive than it's been at any other point in history. And partially that's because we are you know, talking before about our tax system, right? We've is, is that partly on, on you though? As um, you know, you've had a pretty good ear in the Prime Minister for the last, um, uh, you know, the last, last couple of terms and inequality has increased. Yeah, well, so is there a question about how effective I've been? At, at reducing inequality. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, if, I think if you look at our track record over the last few years, you know, we're the ones who have been publicly calling for mm. and lobbying, you know, hardest for things that would reduce inequality, whether that's kind of direct support for low-income families or whether it's changes to the tax system. Uh, you know, we've kind of, we've never varied from that. The fact that Labor's only been marginally interested in that is really a question for them. Should there be billionaires? Should there be billionaires? Um, for me, you know, there's a saying that the highest form of capitalism to create more money, but to, um, you know, make life better for everyone. Um, and I think that the concentration of wealth uh, in the hands of you know, some people who I don't see much evidence that they're doing anything useful suggests that they're not a net asset to society, right? Now, some people are, you know, you can see like in the Gates Foundation and so on, people are actually doing some good with that. But, um, uh, you know, frankly, Peter Thiel and, you know, Elon Musk, if you had $44 billion, you could do a lot of good with that. But buying Twitter, I don't think mm. does anything but for anybody. As, as Chloe Torbrick said, um, Charity is a sign that the state has failed. Should we have allowed them to get to that point where they could make a billion dollars? Well, no. I mean, I, I mean, I've just said, right? I, you know that that we've been saying for years um, that uh, we need to be taxing wealth, not just work, right? But we've created the situation where people who kind of work uh, for a living pay a higher tax rate than than people who have wealth. But does taxing wealth not disincentivize people to work and to aspire to become wealthy through hard work? Well, that implies that um, uh, the cleaner uh, in your office doesn't work hard, right? They work really hard uh, and they don't seem to have become a billionaire, right? So um, I think uh, becoming a billionaire is largely a matter of luck um, and the kind of infrastructure on which people build that wealth is social infrastructure, right? It's like good schools and good you know, transport links that kind of carry their goods up and down. Um, and generally avoiding paying tax on those things means that you're creating wealth off the back of um, you know, other people's labor, essentially. Uh, and so I, I, think it's, I, think it's a, um, I think it's a misnomer, especially in this country where the vast majority of wealth is you know, untaxed capital gain, uh, which people have, got, have actually had virtually no, you know, if I buy a house, and it doubles in value. Have I worked hard? But what would, I guess my response there is what would you say to people, I guess like former Prime Minister John Key's a classic example of that. He came from a state house with a single mother and he managed to achieve all he's achieved. Like, is that just purely through luck that he's 
come up and be able to achieve that. Like he wasn't no, born into. No, it's not. Well, he's also not well. a billionaire, but he's but. Um, uh, no, he, he worked hard, but I'm, what I'm saying is, is that hard work is not the determinant of whether you become fabulously wealthy or not. There are a lot of people in this world who work exceedingly hard and have worked harder than John Key have. They've put in longer hours and more sweat and toil, and somehow, magically, they haven't ended up as multimillionaires. Um, so the circumstances that you come from make an enormous uh, difference to whether or not you can get ahead in life. Um, and uh, And the... Not all wealth, but a lot of wealth uh, had nothing to do uh, with somebody working hard. You know, it was uh, just that the Reserve Bank happened to go through a period of quantitative easing, and guess what? Um, the value of everyone's houses went up by 25%. Well, good on you for all that hard work. <laughs> you know, like it had nothing to do with you. Um, and, and so the fact that, you know, we don't tax that, I just find absurd, you know? To, to wrap up, I just want to explore this geoengineering idea um, quickly quickly once more. There was a paper, a, a big, big bit of science came out lately and said even if we cut emissions to zero today, or, you know, or, or let's say, which, which is unrealistic, let's say we follow the IPC guidelines, yeah. get to 1.5 degrees, we're still going to be at very high risk of um, kicking off these accelerating positive yes. feedback mechanisms. Yeah. So do we need to be you know, exploring something bigger, i.e. Um, ocean alkalinity enhancement, iron fertilization, there's a bunch of new ideas. We don't even really have a single, single scientist in New Zealand who's dedicated to, yeah. to that, or, or is it just political dynamite? No, it's, no it, well, it, again, it depends what you're talking about, right? Because everything, you know, in fixing one problem, do you then create another problem, right? And you just need to apply the precautionary principle at least a wee bit. But... We absolutely do have to, right? Because if you want to hold temperatures to 1.5 degrees above the pre-industrial era, well, let's look at what the concentrations were in, in um, the pre-industrial times. Somewhere between 260 and 280 parts per million. Now we're at 420 parts per million, right? So there's half as much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, half as much again um, in the atmosphere today as there was 200 years ago. And you've got to get that from 420 parts per million back down to about 280 parts per million Otherwise, all of the additional carbon dioxide that's in the atmosphere will continue to heat the atmosphere for as long as it's up there. So you've got to take out more than you put up, much more. We've basically got to take out all the carbon dioxide we've put up over the last 200 years and store it permanently. Now, you cannot do that with trees because today's generation of trees can soak up essentially today's generation of carbon dioxide. But what we've done is we've taken the last 7 billion years worth of trees and dinosaurs, mm. and we've taken all of their carbon, and we've added that into the atmosphere. And today's generation of trees can't absorb the last 7 billion years worth of everything that ever lived. It's not possible. So you're going to have to have some form of mechanical um, carbon capture and storage. Having said that, and there are technologies that are kind of getting there on that, and it is early days, uh, you've, you've got to make sure that you're not, you know, kind of creating some kind of, you know, massive yeah. future problem, right? So messing around with ocean alkalinity and things like that sounds to me pretty damn risky. Mm. I think we should always do the science. We should also explore, you know, kind of all options. But there are other forms where you're, you know, you're kind of binding it minerally to essentially different forms of stone um, and then kind of burying it in an, in an inert, um, you know, uh, putting it back in a hole in the ground. Got any, got any climate tech you're excited about? Tons. I mean, one of the things that's really interesting to me here in Aotearoa is, you know, like we're trying to decarbonise our vehicle fleet. We're buying in EVs and stuff from offshore. But we're becoming quite good at um, electric marine, right? So, you know, Wellington, where I'm from, has got an electric ferry, first in the country. They're probably going to start manufacturing them for Auckland as well. Um, but they're also looking at doing orders for offshore. Uh, tomorrow I'm going to visit Sparky, the electric tugboat, which just won the International Tugboat of the Year Award. <laughs> Who knew that there was such a thing? That there is. Um, and, and so that's a world first, actually. It's the, it's the world's first um, fully electric tugboat in its weight class. Um, you've got the America's Cup Chasers boat, which is um, now powered by hydrogen rather than by diesel. You know, so we're starting to kind of take things that we're you know, quite good at and develop little niches of expertise. And that's, you know, there's your next export <laughs> market, right? So, you know, that, that to me is really exciting. Cool. James Shaw, thanks so much. Thanks so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me on the show. Awesome. Thank cool. you.